Hello, everybody, and welcome to LinkedIn Live. It's Ronnie Chatterjee coming to you from the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University. Today, I'm going to talk about America's new industrial policy. I'm going to talk about why it means big things for government, but also big things for business. Before I start, I want to encourage you to post your questions to LinkedIn. I'll try to talk for about 15 minutes here, and if there are enough questions, uh, take your Q&A uh, after that for the rest of the half hour. You know, industrial policy is one of those hot button topics that's being talked a lot about in the business press, but also in the newspapers that are describing politics and policy debates. I want to try to explain what it is, why it's happening, and what it means for your business and your career. I'll also talk about some of the critiques of industrial policy and the concerns that it might not work. So let's start at the beginning, which is what do I mean by industrial policy? Like a lot of terms, it has a lot of definitions. But for this discussion, I'm talking about when the government, often the federal government of the United States or another country, is supporting industries that they consider to be critical. So think about the recent Chips and Science Act that was passed here in the United States in 2022. The EU also has a Chips Act, and they're doing things similar to that in South Korea. If you think about semiconductors, computer chips, there's a reason why governments might care where they're produced, how they're produced, and who the customers are. Now, Econ 101 says we should just produce those chips anywhere it makes economic sense. And for a long time, that production has been in Asia. But US policymakers have taken the idea that we should be producing more of these chips here in the United States. And so one example of industrial policy is the Chips and Science Act, where the US government put $52 billion with a B into the semiconductor industry to try to locate more of the production onshore in the United States and provide more of the research and development funds for research in the United States as well. That's just one example of what's happening around the world in many different industries. A lot of countries are prioritizing energy transition technologies, solar panels, wind turbines, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen. Other countries are focused on quantum computing or critical minerals that go into electric vehicle supply chains and help produce semiconductors. When you think about the government starting to prioritize different industries, you have to ask yourself a couple questions. First, why now? Why is this something new? Because the title of our LinkedIn Live presentation is America's New Industrial Policy. What makes it new? And why is it happening now of all times? What's going on in the business world or in geopolitics that's made industrial policy have its moment again? And then what could go wrong? These are some questions you should think about throughout the talk. And I'm looking forward to getting your comments and questions in the chat. Let's just start for why it's happening. You know, in the United States, we haven't done this kind of industrial policy for a long time. But in other parts of the world, they've been doing it as a standard part of their economic playbook for over 30 or 40 years. You think about how Taiwan has built up their semiconductor industry. A lot of it had to do with government subsidies that were building up huge manufacturing plants called FABs to produce semiconductors and also attract the best and brightest talent to Taiwan to work in that industry. In fact, Morris Chang, the founder of the famous Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, was originally working in Texas when the incentives provided by Taiwan were enough to bring him back to start a world-leading company. Now, what are some of the risks when you have a project like that? Well, it's not clear that every part of the world can be a major producer for semiconductors or any other product. So when the government puts hundreds of billions of dollars, in some cases, into different industries, it can be an opportunity for business but also a challenge in terms of trying to figure out whether they should apply for the money, how they would use it, and whether you can actually build a sustainable business model based on these government supports. At the end of the day, governments are hoping to lay the foundation for new industries, not fund them forever. And so when you think about the Chips and Science Act or the Inflation Reduction Act here in the United States, the idea of industrial policy in the United States is to lay the foundation for new industries and technologies, but hope that the private sector does the rest to keep these industries from becoming permanently dependent on the government. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the risk section. When you think about why it's happening now in the United States, well, in other parts of the world, while it's been used for quite some time, in the United States, it fell out of fashion in the 90s, in the 2000s, primarily because of the knowledge that it might be looked at, or the insight and that it was picking winners in the economy. So if you want the government to allocate money to particular industries, you might say, how is the government going to choose which companies get the money? Does government have the right expertise to funnel capital, which should maybe be funneled by the market in a perfect world, to the industries of the future? And a lot of folks lost faith in the ability of government to make those decisions, and there's lots of examples we'll talk about later of where it's gone wrong. 
So industrial policy really wasn't something that people were talking much about in the United States over the last 20 years. Something changed, though, during the pandemic. And it started, I think, with the issues related to supply chains. Remember when we couldn't get toilet paper and other kinds of products that we took for granted during the pandemic? All of a sudden, what had become what it used to be a very wonky term, supply chains, turned into a first order political and economic issue. Prices of cars went up in 2021 and 2022. In fact, in 2021, the rise in car prices was one third of inflation. If you think about the macroeconomic impact that that had, you start to look at the causes. And why were car prices so high? Because supply chain bottlenecks. It was difficult to get things like computer chips into the United States and into the automobiles that they need them for. And so you had a lot of dealers stuck with a lot of inventory that didn't have computer chips. You might say, why do you need a computer chip to drive a car? Well, it turns out automobiles, like a lot of other products, are increasingly computerized. If you think about what operates your driver assist mechanism, the monitoring the tire pressure, the inverter for the engine, all those kinds of the aspects of the automobile depend on chips. In many ways, you can think about computer chips as the DNA of the built environment. And so when we couldn't get those chips, supply chains slowed down, these products were either more expensive or unavailable. And so during the pandemic, there was a renewed appreciation among US policymakers that it wasn't good enough to just have just-in-time inventory. You needed to have just-in-case. And I know this both from my research as an economist here at the Fugle School of Business and Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University, but also because I was in government during that time as the chief economist for the Department of Commerce, where my responsibility was to uh, develop new techniques to help the government monitor and, and implement supply chain resilient solutions, and then later at the White House running the chips and science implementation. Through so those experiences, combined with my academic research, working with lots of different businesses and policymakers, that I come to this idea of why industrial policy came back into fashion. I saw interest in business and in government in the idea of making our supply chain stronger to make sure that the things that happened during the pandemic didn't happen again. And that was one big factor in why there's been this return towards investing in having more capacity, particularly to manufacture things in the United States. There's a second big factor, and it's geopolitical. A lot of the goods that we rely on each and every day in the United States and many other parts of the world come from China. As the U.S.-China relationship is changing, so is people's views of those, or so are people's views of that relationship and, and the reluctance of folks to be dependent on Chinese supply chains. What you see here in the United States is an interest in building back resilience to not just depend on Chinese manufactured goods, but to be able to make more of them here, particularly in industries that are really sensitive for national security. So if you think about computer chips, for example, there's a lot of focus on the use of computer chips in everything with an on and off switch that our military and defense systems use. If that's not manufactured in the US, right, it can be a vulnerability for the United States and its national security. And so the other reason I think there's been a turn towards investing in home, investing in manufacturing, is because of the national security rationale and a changing US-China relationship. So that's why industrial policy has come back. This investment in manufacturing here in the US, I think the pandemic experience and the idea that national security might trump economics 101 in some cases. Now, what does it actually mean for the country and what's happening? Well, right now you're seeing over $688 billion of private sector investment in areas like batteries, chips, electric vehicles here in the United States. And a lot of that is because of two really important pieces of legislation that were passed in the last several years. The first one is the one I talked about already, the Chips and Science Act. In August of 2022, Republicans and Democrats came together in bipartisan fashion to approve $52 billion of support for the semiconductor industry. When government makes a decision like that, both to provide funds, but also loans and tax credits to an industry, it stirs up a tremendous private sector interest in making investments in those same sectors. For a long time, a lot of private sector investors wouldn't look at the semiconductor industry, particularly on the hardware side of building new fabs, because of the economics and it not penciling out. But once you have these incentives, it changes the calculus. And what you're seeing all over the world now, and in the United States specifically, is massive new investments in semiconductors since the Chips and Science Act passed. So since that law was signed into, or since that bill was signed to law in August of 2022, over $200 billion of private sector investment has been announced in the Chips and Science Act. This is the way industrial policy is supposed to work. The idea is that the government lays the foundation by providing tax credits, incentives, or other kinds of support for industry, and then the private sector looks at this industry as less risky, more opportunities for investment, and funnels in the private capital. The ability to funnel in private capital, to crowd it in, is gonna be what makes industrial policy work or not. 
And so government policymakers are paying a lot of attention to what business leaders are talking about, which incentives are working and which aren't. Look at the same issues around the Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act is one of the biggest climate legislations ever be passed in the United States. It provides hundreds of billions of dollars in incentives for everything from electric vehicles to hydrogen to solar to wind to nuclear. And what you'll see there is those incentives are having the same impact as the incentives had on the CHIPS Act. When you think about sort of the incentives, you're looking at now $77 billion of private sector investment in clean energy manufacturing. You're looking at $165 billion in EVs and batteries. Now, some of that investment might happen anyway, which is a big challenge for industrial policy advocates. You have to be able to show these investments would have happened, these investments wouldn't have happened without government intervention. And that's difficult to show, and we'll talk about that later in the critiques. But you are seeing a big boom in clean energy manufacturing and investments here in the United States. My home state of North Carolina, where I'm talking to you from right now, is a good example. In North Carolina, over the last three years, we've had a massive investment in battery production, as Toyota is gonna to build batteries in Liberty, North Carolina. You have investments in lithium and lithium processing. Lithium is one of the really important inputs in the EV supply chain, electric vehicles, and that's happening here in North Carolina. And you have all sorts of complementary battery projects and plants across North Carolina that are supported by the Inflation Reduction Act. You also have this idea that you can build electric vehicles here. And so VinFast recently announced a big project, a Vietnamese electric vehicle company, to build electric vehicles here in North Carolina. Some of these things would have happened surely without tax credits. North Carolina is an attractive place to do business, and a lot of companies want to locate here. But some of these companies directly cited the Inflation Reduction Act incentives when they made the decisions to locate here in North Carolina. And if it comes together and these projects complete, you're going to have a huge opportunity to create a new battery belt here in North Carolina. And that's good for everyone, people who supported the industrial policy called the Inflation Reduction Act and people who didn't. If it was doing great jobs in new industries like electric vehicles along the supply chains, you create new opportunities for the people in your region and your state. And that's the other part of industrial policy. It's not just to support technologies that have national security importance. The hope is that you create opportunities for new high paying jobs. And you're seeing that both in the chips industry and electric vehicles. Let me talk a second about sort of what's next and what comes down the pike. You know, when companies um, start investing in the United States, other countries are going to look and say, oh, we want to get a share of that. We're going to provide our own incentives. And surely that's happening. You see in Canada, similar incentives for clean energy, in Europe, in Korea, in Japan. And of course, in China, they've been looking at these incentives and implementing them for a long time. And so there'll be potential competition between countries to get manufacturing facilities and these critical technologies and R&D and some of the technologies of the future, or I should say the present, when you think about AI and quantum, um, and trying to get those within their borders. And so one worry for people who support these kind of industrial policies is that you might have a race to the bottom where all these countries are competing against each other to attract these firms and end up destroying a lot of public value by giving away tax incentives and not getting the benefits from having that private sector investment. And we really have to watch that carefully going forward. We don't have time today to talk about how to avoid that, but there's got to be a high priority both for government and business to avoid those kind of races to the bottom. The second thing to look at is how other countries are responding to specific industry policies. In Japan right now, you have a Japanese investment corporation, JIC, which is an arm of the government, and they've purchased semiconductor companies like JSR or Shinko to try to improve Japanese positions in the semiconductor industry. And you see countries making big bets that are going to have an impact on how the supply chains are run. That's another thing to watch. The next thing people are paying a lot of attention to is, are these tax credits actually going to be durable? You know, President Biden is in office now. He's the one who signed these bills we're talking about. But you'll see future presidential administrations. And we have an election coming up in November. What if a new president, say President Trump or a later president, doesn't like these tax credits? How long lasting will they be? And if business leaders are making investment decisions based on tax credits, that could be a big problem. Because one of the things business leaders hate is uncertainty. Well, think about it this way. Look at the bipartisan support, both Republicans and Democrats, that support of the CHIPS Act. You see a lot of support for CHIPS being important to national security. And so regardless of what kind of administration is in office now or in the future, you could see continued support for these kinds of incentives. The Inflation Reduction Act had a different configuration of supporters. Only Democrats who supported that bill in 2022. And so as you look at the Inflation Reduction Act and the specific tax credits, there might be specific pieces that are more or less vulnerable depending on how popular they are around the country. So one thing to watch is how the political dynamics in the country, the United States is just one example, affects support for these kind of industrial policies. And finally, 
look at other industries where they might be seeking to attract this kind of investment as well. For example, we might need another version of the Chips Act in another industry. Think biopharma, ag, biotech, industries that are seen as critically important. The question for government and business is, is this money really needed? Can we afford it? Is it going to have the generative effect on investments in this industry? That, I think, will be a debate that will shape a lot of economic policy in the United States going forward. And finally, we just need more research on what works. A lot of my work here back at Duke, coming back to the government, has been trying to investigate the causes and effects of industrial policies, trying to understand what works, what's been beneficial for business, what's been beneficial for government, and how it affects workforce and community development. And that's something that needs to continue if we're going to get this right. At the end of the day, I think there's some key critiques of industrial policy that I want to talk about. I look forward to taking questions uh, or comments if you have them, so please add them to the chat. I see a couple already, and we'll, we'll get to them. One is, I think, a really reasonable critique that if the government's picking winners and losers in industries, saying this firm gets money and this firm doesn't, they might make mistakes, and they might not have the capability to make those decisions. This is a really important critique, and it's why we need to have a lot of oversight and monitoring of what we're doing and a lot of studying of whether we're doing it right. You know, one way to sort of reduce this risk of picky winners is to have really talented and nonpartisan people as part of the adjudication criteria for choosing who gets these awards. Sometimes that can be really hard in government, but if you look at the group of people that I personally worked with in the government, I think you'll find a lot of people with technology, financial, and legal expertise, as well as significant government expertise, who are trying to make the best decisions they can. Now, surely they're going to make some mistakes, and sometimes they're going to pick the wrong company to support. But overall, we have to think about it like a portfolio. One of the most famous examples of failed industrial policies actually proves the rule. You think about Solyndra, which is the common retort that most people have. They say, oh, government supported a company and then it failed. But that company, Solyndra, was part of a broader portfolio that included companies like Tesla. And so you have to look at the entire portfolio when you think about the effectiveness of a policy. But for public perceptions of industrial policy, people are going to read about the failures probably more than the successes. And their faith in the government to be able to pick the right companies and make the right investments is going to depend on how those stories are written and what their perceptions are of what was driving the decision making. And that's going to be a challenge for industrial policy. Another way to think about it is, rather than supporting specific companies, we should be thinking about industries or technologies that are more broad-based, that lots of different companies, big and small, can be used. That's the other drawback of a lot of industrial policies. How do small companies, entrepreneurs, innovators get access to these funds? And how do they benefit from all these investments the government is making? Well, one way to think about it is creating more open access tools. Think about the semiconductor industry. If we invest in a bunch of research and development that only the big companies can use, we're not going to support an entrepreneurial ecosystem, people with great ideas, but not the money to build their own factory who could be really useful in the industry. And so when we think about setting up things like a national semiconductor technology center, one of the things we'll do with the chips money, we need to think about creating tools and platforms that anybody can use and that startups with great ideas can test their designs on and learn from. That's an opportunity, I think, to make these things work better and reduce some of the risk. The last thing I'll say about this is that, you know, we might worry that the government is wasting money on these projects. And that's a really important concern on any government project. Keep watching whether the private capital is matching the public sector money. Right now, we're seeing a lot of private sector investment being announced. We're going to hope that, that those projects actually get completed and the money gets deployed. But I think when industrial policy fails, it's often because government's investing in things where there isn't really a strong business case, and the business case doesn't get better once government invests. So think about whether the private sector money that's coming in and really is past that market test is there. And that's one thing to watch going forward. I think the other thing to think about is we can't necessarily expect these industrial policies to affect specific places all the time. You know, if we're going to incentivize electric vehicle production, it could happen in many different parts of the country. And so you're seeing that as EV factories are spread out all around the country, but particularly now in the southeast where I live. And so trying to target specific places with these policies can be really difficult and a challenge for industrial policymakers as well. And finally, when we've done these kind of policies before, we've often, particularly in the post-war era, we haven't thought about communities that are left behind and we haven't thought about carbon intensity, right? If we use industrial policies and end up with a bunch of more carbon intensive industries, we're gonna create new problems and exacerbate existing problems. And if we leave communities behind, as we did in the past with big infrastructure investments that split communities like the ones that I know in North Carolina, you're gonna have challenges in terms of implementing this with fidelity and seeing the benefits that to accrue to all kinds of people. And so one of the things for policymakers to think about when they make investments in semiconductors or they make investments in electric vehicles is, who has the opportunities to get these jobs in the future? 
what kinds of programs are there in our communities to get people an on-ramp into those positions? Or are you just going to create benefits for people and regions that already have them? That's a big question that they should ask going forward and some things to think about going forward. So as we think about it, I think how this plays out is going to have an impact on businesses in every area. Whether you work at a company in one of these industries, producing semiconductor chips, electric vehicles or batteries, or whether you work in the companies that are advising these companies, thinking about consulting or providing finance or financial services. So whether you're in any of those industries, which are the top ones for MBAs, right, tech, finance, consulting, I think you're going to be interacting with the impact of these policies. So something that starts off being very much of a government initiative ends up having its impact in the business community more than we ever could have imagined. And when you think about the decisions that CEOs are making every day, they're deciding where to locate, how to use tax incentives, whether to apply to governments for grants and funding. And if you think about the trajectory of the industries that you're interested in, whether it's AI, quantum, or the energy transition, all of this is going to be affected by these large investments in industrial policy. So as you think about your career, you want to both think about where those investments are going, the impact on their communities, and which firms and potential employers for you are the most interested in those funds and leverage them for maximum benefit both for the private sector imperative, but also to create more benefits to the communities they operate in. With that, let me turn to a couple questions that I'm seeing on LinkedIn and uh, looking forward to getting more of your thoughts and comments on here. So I think that um, one question that came up, which I think is a really good one is, we have an economic playbook right now, and Shagufta, this is a great question, about sort of implementing and, and or including that basically we're going to implement policies, but how do we focus on not just policies at the federal government level in Washington, D.C., but policies at the community level where I sit right now in Durham, North Carolina? And I think what you're probably getting at is the idea that sometimes these things sound great in theory, but in practice, they don't always work. I think the key thing starts with the communication. When I worked in the government, a lot of my work was going around and having pretty apolitical discussions with people about, hey, here's where the money's coming. Here's what it means for you. Here's how you can be ready. And readiness can do have to do with the way community colleges and local foundations and even K-12 education are thinking about training students and giving them the education experts they need to thrive in this new economy. If you know certain investments are coming to town and you see this all around North Carolina, where I know best, you see all the different community institutions clicking into place to take advantage of it. So you can't have a battery bill in North Carolina where you're producing all these batteries and electric vehicles if you don't have the training from community colleges like Durham Tech, Wake Tech, and others. You can't have it without changing the way we do K-12 education and putting a focus on these areas and giving students information about these jobs. And you also can't do it without supportive zoning, permitting, other things can be really important for the manufacturing industries of the future. And so what you're seeing now, and on the philanthropic side too, is a lot of focus on how do we create that ecosystem so that community development needs to happen and the community investment that needs to happen actually works. And Jagutta, I think the communities that do it best are going to be the ones that attract the most investment. A good question from, from Johan about how do we maintain oversight. Very, very important. I think for people who are advocates and want this stuff to succeed, people who are opponents and think it's a bad idea, both should agree that we need to have transparency. We need to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Because if the government is seen as giving uh, money to politically connected firms or people that are big donors to campaigns or in the right states, people lose faith in the whole policy framework that's supposed to benefit the entire country. One thing we can do is try to provide more transparent data from the government about where the money's going. Um, the Biden administration has an Investing in America website that has a fantastic map of where all the investments are going. The other thing is we should have information about those tax credits and grants that are publicly available, which they are, but also explain through webinars, community meetings, to make sure people understand actually what's available. The last piece, and you get to this, Johan, with your point about impact measures, man, when I was working on the CHIPS Act, one of the things I thought about most was how do I tell people what our goals are in a clear fashion? ex ante before we start the program so that when we deliver or don't on these promises, people are going to be able to judge it themselves. A lot of times we pass these laws, we move the goalpost to use the football analogy, and we say, oh, we, we succeeded. Look what we did without really being true to the original mission. What we did in February of 2023 was we released a report from the CHIPS office in the Commerce Department that basically laid out very specifically what the goals are for the Chips and Science Act. You'll see that across some of the other different pieces of legislation. But when it came to the things I was working on, we released that report that said, look, we want to build two leading edge clusters for semiconductor manufacturing in the US. We want to have a certain level of memory and a certain investment in R&D in particular areas. We laid out very clear criteria. 
and a rationale for why national security was going to be a really top priority for how we made those decisions, the number one priority. And so as we thought about those things, we released them, even though there was some risk in that, because we wanted people to know how to judge our work by. And so I think being transparent on the front end is really important. You know, and it doesn't mean that these things aren't going to be controversial. It doesn't mean we're not going to have honest and well-intentioned debates, and there's going to be a lot of political back and forth. But I think one way to do it is set out the criteria beforehand, and you're probably going to get a little more credit uh, for when you succeed and maybe a little more grace when you fail. Johan, you have another question. This is really good. So I think you're saying education is a key factor on the perception of these policies. Yeah, so think about, he's bringing up nuclear power. I mean, so think about this in the following way. I think, at least in the United States, um, the government hasn't done this kind of thing for a long time. And so one of the things I have a lot of fun was just talking to folks about why it's happening, as I did today, what it means for their community, uh, and all the reasons why it could be a good idea or not. I think if you explain it to people, people can judge it for themselves. And if they see the change in their community that are positive, and they think that the cost benefit is worth it, you're going to have sort of more support for these things in the future if it's important to the United States or other countries. I think when you have lots of sort of failures, um, sort of problems with the program, slowness in implementation, people having a sense that it's not showing up in their neighborhood, you're much more less likely to have success over the long term. So I agree with you that education on these kinds of policies is really important. I think the other great opportunity here is, unlike a lot of issues that are at the intersection of business and public policy, take tax policy, for example, this one doesn't have to be so partisan or so divided. One of the problems with information is that some people are going to give you the information from their perspective and their bias, and that's that's hard to avoid. We're all guilty of that. You know, I worked on these policies, so it's hard, obviously, for me to be totally separated from them. And someone else might oppose these policies as a matter of principle and say, no matter what you show me, I disagree. The good thing here, unlike working on taxes or other issues, is I think there's actually a lot of common ground that people agree with. For example, the national security part of it is something that brings people together all across the political spectrum. And so we can judge some of these programs by whether they support our national security and probably have a better discussion than something that's very polarized into right and left. For business leaders navigating this, I think that's also helpful. You know, you can think about these things not by taking a side in the political debate, but by looking at whether the policies actually achieve these national goals. So when it comes to, you know, U.S. Uh, dominance or U.S. leads in key, in key technologies. These are things that are national priorities, not necessarily things that are partisan. I think that can help as opposed to a lot of issues we talk about every day related to business and public policy that are much, much more divided and make it a lot more difficult. I think the other piece that you mentioned, Johan, is this idea of permitting and building big projects. There's a lot of talk about how easy or not it is to build the United States versus other, pro versus other countries. I think it's a big question. A lot of the times that we have a process to challenge these kind of projects is because of environmental concerns. And it's interesting because a lot of the infrastructure we're building has a potential to help us decarbonize and lower carbon emissions. And these things can sometimes be at odds in the short term. But over the long term, we need robust processes to make sure that we're not doing damage to the environment when we're investing. We actually need to have projects that get done and completed. And so I think you'll see a lot of emphasis, again, across the board, both in this administration and future administrations. I try to make sure projects get done uh, in predictable timelines. And I think what people are looking for sometimes isn't just slow or fast, but predictable so they can make investment decisions. That's going to be key if we're going to succeed in industrial policy, because if you're building stuff again in America at scale, regardless of where state you're on, regardless where you're coming from politically, you gotta find a system to make sure those projects actually get done in a reasonable time frame. And so I think you'll hear a lot more about those topics um, in, in the areas you've highlighted, but other ones going forward. Um, I, I noticed we're short for time, so let me just wrap up with a couple comments. So first, for folks who are interested in talking about this more, uh, continue to post your questions to LinkedIn and uh, and follow the Fugal School of Business on LinkedIn where we'll continue these kind of conversations. I want to say also that we're going to continue to have these discussions both on social media, but also here at Fugal physically. Recently, we had a conference on how the Inflation Reduction Act is crowding in private capital. And we had John Podesta and Jigger Shaw, administration officials, but also a lot of private sector leaders from firms like KKR, General Catalyst, Breakthrough Energy, and Honeywell. We're trying to bring together business, political, and nonprofit leaders together to have these conversations, exactly the questions that were posed around community investment decisions, how businesses are going to do this, and what government policymakers need to know that they don't know already. So keep watching this channel and keep stay tuned to Fuqua for some of these topics as we explore how industrial policy and other big economic trends are affecting your business and your career. Thanks everyone for watching and hope to see you next time on LinkedIn Live.